Hello, everyone. We're going to get started shortly. So just get settled in and uh, we will begin in just a moment. Just confirming, Maya, you're going to tell us when we're going to get started, correct? Yes, okay. and I think we have Kurt Mass, so um, go ahead, Todd. Thank you. Oh, great. Welcome, folks, this, uh, this Thursday afternoon. We are very fortunate to have Max Bazerman uh, tell us about his most recent book, Better Not Perfect, A Realist Guide to Maximum Sustainable Goodness. So Max, an introduction of Max could take the entire remainder of this time, this session, but I will, I will highlight a, a handful of relevant facts. One, he started the Behavioral Insights Group with Iris Bonnet uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, the group that is organizing this, that Maya is the program director for and I'm the faculty director for. Uh, he also is widely uh, considered to be one of the great behavioral scientists of our time, but also uh, one of the best advisors that uh, of, of other faculty, other doctoral students that become faculty members. He was my advisor uh, um, along with dozens of other uh, current behavioral scientists. Um, this book, having read through it, it, it is a, a really impressive integration of so much of the works that Mac, work that Max has done over the last several decades, and I am excited to hear him present it to us. So Max, thank you for joining. Thank you, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the introduction, and um, I do take pride in my spectacular former advisees, including Todd. Um, so um, the agenda for the talk, and I'm planning on talking for about 35 or, or 40 minutes and then opening up for um, question and answer through the Q&A, which uh, Todd will uh, curate. Um, my goal is um, to provide a, a pathway to being better, not perfect, and quite consistent with the values of the Harvard Kennedy School and um, the Behavioral Insights uh, student group um, to identify strategies on how you can create more value in the world, in society. Um, and I wanna sort of um, create a parallel between the decision-making literature that so many of you are familiar with, where we've long had this kind of strange um, goal state of rationality, even though we can't get there. Um, and there's kind of modern versions of, um, of rationality where it's okay to value the outcomes of others, okay to value non-financials. So it's a, it's a, a sort of open definition of, of what it is you're trying to accomplish in your rationality. But we, uh, we know that there are bounds to our rationality um, and in the, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, we sp spend a lot of time on figuring out how to get beyond those bounds so that we can prescribe more rational action. Um, I wanna do the same thing in Better Not Perfect, only the goal state is to maximize value creation, what economists might call social welfare, um, and philosophers described under um, a notion of utilitarianism. And I wanna highlight that it kind of matches on to rationality in the sense that it provides a useful goal state, even if we won't necessarily get there. Um, and there are, there's lots of modern writing. I think of Peter Singer and Josh Green as um, sort of um, current um, utilitarian philosophers um, who are very good at thinking about the complexity of thinking through second order effects 
and, and what that means in terms um, of what is the, 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 what is the behavior that will create the most value. Um, but there are a bunch of bounds to utilitarianism, which um, I'm accusing most of you of having, and certainly I'm accusing myself of having these bounds. Um, biases, our own selfishness, our mythical fixed pie, our tribalism or in-group favoritism. Um, and I want to provide pathways for thinking about how we can get beyond some of our bounds um, to prescribe strategies that would allow all of us to create more value in the world. Okay, now this um, term utilitarianism, lots of people have highlighted the fact that it's, it was just a terrible term um, and it conjures up all kinds of things that weren't intended. Um, but if we look at Bentham, Mill, Singer, Green, uh, we, get, we basically have this notion of maximizing aggregate pleasure, minimizing, aggre uh, minimizing aggregate pain, or what I'm calling creating more value. Um, that we're efficient in how we do it, that, we're, that we don't make decisions based on who we are in terms of our own preferences from that identity, and that we value equality um, of, of the interests of all. And these four pieces look pretty good to most of us. And as I go through the talk, I just hope that you'll explore whether in fact um, you actually do these things and whether there are some strategies that would allow you to create more value um, by doing these things better. Okay, now to um, understand the concept of utilitarianism. Many of you have seen this before, so I'm going to work through it a little bit quickly. Um, but there will be some new pieces. So even those of you who know Trolley Land, I'll ask you to pay careful attention. Um, and, and for the Trolley Land veterans, notice that there are three people on the left when you were expecting five. So the problem I want you to think about here, and, and that's you with a question mark over your head, um, is that there's a trolley coming down the track, and if you do nothing, it's going to go down, down the left-hand side, kill those nice three people, and that will be an instant and painless death. But if you turn the switch, it'll move to the other track instead. You'll save the three. Unfortunately, the person on the right-hand track will die an instant and painless death. And do you switch or not? And I'll tell you across a number of experiments, about three quarters of the people um, switch in order to get this kind of three for one deal. That's very consistent with this idea of utilitarianism um, to maximize aggregate good um, or minimize aggregate pain. One dying is not as bad as three dying. But utilitarianism runs into more of a problem in what's often called the footbridge problem. Again, you'll recognize yourself with a question mark. There's a guy on the bridge, there's a trolley. It's, this time it's gonna kill five people. Um, <clears throat> and the way you can save the five is that you can turn the switch, the floor will open up under the guy uh, on top of the bridge. He will fall to the track. He will get, he will, um, get hit by the train, die an instant painless death and become what we technically call a trolley stopper. And the question is, do you switch or not? And I'll very quickly tell you that when we run this in experimental context, less than half of the people drop the guy from the bridge, even though you're being offered a five for one deal. So there's something emotionally problematic with the, uh, with the notion of dropping the guy. Um, and despite the fact that people took the three for one deal, they're not taking the five for one deal. Now I want to show you one more version of this problem. And this time uh, you'll recognize yourself instantly because you always look the same. Um, this time there are two trains coming down two different tracks. Um, the one on the left is going to kill three people if you do nothing. The one on the right is going to kill five people if you do nothing. You can turn switch A or switch B, but you don't have the ability to turn to switch both. So it's A, B, or neither. And what's interesting, I think, about this problem is that now when people have the two trains coming down, as the decision maker, they like switching B over A. So while A was more, uh, was preferred over B, when only one train was coming down the track, with both trains coming down, down the track, people like B over A. And this is consistent 
with a whole lot of research that I've been connected to that shows that when we look at one option at a time, um, our emotive concerns typically have a significant influence. Uh, and that's why um, when we saw the B train alone, we didn't drop the guy. But now in a comparative context, we tend to be more deliberative um, and we tend to make better decisions under joint than under separate. And we also tend to be more utilitarian. In other research with um, Iris Bonnet and Alexandra Van Geen, we show that people discriminate less under joint than under separate as well. Okay, so um, utilitarians switch and they push, um, but there are people who don't like utilitarianism in its extreme form because they value the justice, rights, liberty, and autonomy in ways that might even override the collective good. And for those of you who have these uh, deontological or libertarian tendencies, I don't want to talk you out of them. I simply want to suggest that given whatever added constraints or values you want to add to, to, to morality, you still want to do as much good as you can. And that's going to be the theme of the talk and what the book is trying to accomplish. Okay, so um, what I want you to notice is that the goal um, was to use joint decision making to prescribe a structure that will lead more people to act in more utilitarian ways. Um, I want to try another strategy um, on how to encourage people to become more utilitarian, taking the tougher problem, problem B, of dropping the guy. And um, I've already shared with you that the majority of people don't go for that. Um, but I want to introduce um, an intervention. And the intervention comes from John Rawls, who had a concept called the veil of ignorance. And Rawls argued if we want to, if we want to get people to think about what would be fair, um, it's important to get them out of the mindset that's created by their own identity, by their own nationality, by their own gender, by their own wealth conditions, et cetera. And that's what we want to do to show that we can improve the value that, we're that we create in, soci in society by getting people to adopt a veil of ignorance. I'm gonna do that on the trolley problem and then we're going to move from there to how to allocate some scarce resources under COVID. So now imagine that instead of just seeing this problem, we first asked you to think about the following problem. Um, you are one of the six people involved in this dilemma. You have a one-sixth chance of being the guy on the bridge and a five-sixth chance of being one of the people on the track. So if the decision maker does not switch, then there's a five-sixth chance you're going to pass an instant of painless death. If the decision maker does switch, there's a one-sixth chance. Um, and the reverse, um, if the person um, does switch. Looking at this problem as one of the potential participants in this story, most people say, I hope that the person switches. But more importantly, when we then switch people to the decision maker and ask them, do they switch or not? Now, all of a sudden, a significant higher percentage, more than half, are switching because they've just worked through the wisdom of value creation that occurs with the switch move. And now they're in favor of it as a moral decision as well. So thinking through the veil of ignorance seems to, improve, to increase the objectivity and the utilitarianism of the decision maker. Now, um, some of you might be tired of trolley land by now, so let's move to uh, an important problem. Um, and that is how to allocate scarce resources during COVID. Now, um, this, the data I'm going to show you um, was obviously connected, collected after um, the breakout had occurred. Um, if 
if I was working on this problem today, um, uh, I could very well think of thinking in, into the future in terms of the allocation of vaccines, which uh, is a likely scarce resource coming up. And we, and we can potentially talk about how the decision would be different for vaccines than for ventilators. So I want you to think about the question, if you were on a hospital ethics committee, um, of, uh, and some of you, for the Kennedy School students, you might have seen Chris Robichaud's Liberty Hospital case. I think that this is quite compatible with that. Um, but um, for everybody, I want you to be thinking about how should a hospital think about allocating scarce resources? So I want you to think about the following. The hospital should, a hospital's only remaining ventilator should the hospital's only remaining ventilator be given to a 65-year-old patient who arrived at a hospital first, and that would follow a first-come, first-serve policy, or a 25-year-old patient who arrived moments later, which would follow the strategy of save the most life years, and that would be broadly consistent with utilitarianism. Um, assume that the patient who gets the ventilator lives and the other patient dies, of course, you want more information about this particular problem um, because I'm a 65-year-old. I would want you to know if it's me. Um, that was meant to be a joke in webinar form. Um, but more seriously, um, you, you would want more information, but we want to abstract that away. So simply knowing that you're picking between a 65-year-old who might get an expected 20 more years of life or a 25-year-old who might get an expected 60 years of life who should get the ventilator, okay? Now, um, we asked a large number of people this question, and we see what's often described as self-serving biases. People 18 to 30 want to give it to the young person. They're on board with saving the most life, life years possible or doing what they would, would want if they were, in fact, in the story. But the people over 60, Okay, are in favor of giving it to the 65-year-old. Okay. Again, lots of social psychology consistent with that result. But now what we want to do is add um, the veil of ignorance to the problem. And this, the data I'm about to show you has been published um, by a group of us um, in, in Harvard Business Review Digital. Um, what I want you to do is imagine and this is a little strange, that there's a 50% chance that you're the 25-year-old and a 50% 50 ch 50 chance you're the 65-year-old. Um, what would you want the decision maker to be to do? And most people now do the arithmetic and say, I'd rather that I had a 50% chance to get an extra 60 years and a 50% chance to get an extra 20 years so people want the 25-year-old to get it. But then we ask them the same question that we just asked the, the individuals without the veil of ignorance. We ask, who should get, what, who should get it? What, what would be fairest um, or most ethical? And now what's striking is that the self-serving biases disappear dramatically. Now, everybody, well, not everybody, 62% uh, of all age groups are now in favor of giving it to the young person. So the, the young group was already there, but the older individuals, once they think through the veil of ignorance, are now moving to the realization that the young person gets more value, can, ben can benefit more, and that that's the most moral decision possible. Okay, so that's kind of highlights the um, general orientation of what I want to accomplish in the book. I want to identify interventions. I want to identify prescriptions that will move us to create more value in society. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, a few ways of doing that. One we've been talking about, um, and that's to deliberate more than using your intuition. Um, undoubtedly, we all use our intuition a great deal um, when we make hundreds of small decisions every day. And all of us 
may need to use our intuition because there isn't time to deliberate. So if there's a fire in your kitchen, um, work really hard to put it out. And your intuition is probably a better guide than using a cost benefit analysis on alternative strategies that you write down and carefully analyze. So there are obviously times when we um, use our intuition either because of time or the low importance of the decision. But I think that there's a wealth of evidence that deliberation wins over intuition for making important decisions. Um, so um, this is all highly consistent with what you've um, read about in Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, where he talks about the difference between system one and system two. And system two wins in terms of the quality of decision. Josh Green, in his book, Moral Tribes, talks about two different systems from a moral perspective. And I would argue that the overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming evidence supports the notion that, um, that system two or deliberation wins over intuition in terms of creating more value in, ter in terms of the morality of our decisions. Now, a lot of people love their intuition. And it may well be that your intuition is better than the intuition of lots of other people. But I think it's highly doubtful that your intuition is better than the deliberative thought that you could bring to the same problem. This is very different than what many other people want you to believe. So Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Blink, um, which is written amazingly well, wants to convince you to trust your intuition. Um, I, I believe that that's very bad advice. And I also think that it's less moral. Another thing that I think we want to do is to sort of think about value creation across others as a way of life. Um, many of you have been through a negotiation class. Um, Harvard Kennedy School, like the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Law School, teach a lot of negotiation classes. And one of the most common themes that we'll, you'll see in a negotiation class is the idea of value creation, or economists would use the term moving to the Pareto efficient frontier. So if we're at point A in life, okay, and there's you and the other party, how do we move to the Northeast? What I do in this chart, I make a very small change. Instead of having the other party you're negotiating with on the horizontal axis, I have the value created to all other sentient beings in the world on the right hand side. And what I want to suggest is that there's lots of ways to harness your time, your resources, and your decisions so that you can get to decisions that are to the Northeast. So I'm not asking you to sacrifice in order to go from A to C, okay? or to be more selfish by going to A to B. I'm asking you to be wiser and finding ways um, to create more value while not without necessarily asking you to sacrifice your own personal well-being. And I'll, I'm going to come back to um, what the, some of the domains where we could see that will be in just a couple of slides. Um, but first, I want to talk about one other issue, and that is to think about all the pleasure and pain that we create. Um, this is a cartoon from about 100 years ago. Um, and this is a two-part Andrew Carnegie. And Andrew Carnegie was a famous industrialist, um, um, uh, owner of the U of US Steel. And um, he was famous for two things. Um, one, he was a famous philanthrop uh, philanthropist. And his name is all over Pittsburgh and New York for his philanthropy. Um, but he was also a ruthless leader who made decisions that led to the death, de to the deaths and suffering of large numbers of steelworkers. Um, and many of his actions were certainly um, value destroying, um, undoubtedly unethical, and perhaps criminal in terms of. Um, his actions. Modern day equivalent, we can think of the Sacklers, 
whose name is in lots of universities, on lots of healthcare centers, on lots of cultural institutions. So they're very good on some dimensions, but they also are significantly responsible for the opioid, scan, uh, opioid disaster, which has killed so many people. They are the owners of Purdue Pharmaceuticals, and they not only marketed it, but undoubtedly mismarketed their products to increase the addictions that would occur throughout society. And I think a lot of us are prone to thinking about the good that we do. And there's probably more opportunity to think about op areas where perhaps we aren't doing as good of a job of creating value. Okay, so I wanna talk about some different domains where I think we can be better. Um, one of those is noticing evil and speaking up when it occurs. Um, uh, you can almost pick your scandal, whether it's Theranos or Madoff or Enron. Um, there were people who saw the evil and didn't do anything to stop it. Okay? Um, and in many ways, they became collaborators with the evildoers um, and as a re result, destroyed lots of value. I personally believe that um, the President of the, of the United States is doing a dramatic amount of evil and the failure of other members of his party to be willing to speak up when he's engaged in truly unethical actions, I find remarkably disturbing. Um, I think that when people are engaged in wrongdoing that destroys value, it is our obligation as citizens, as um, part of Harvard University, to note that and to speak up and say so. I think that there are times when there's too much waste in society. And you can think of this in terms of wasted food at the end of dinner, um, which I think is a significant problem. Um, but we can also think about sort of waste in terms of how we create various interactions in the business context. One of the examples I talk about in the book is, um, is the competition for Amazon's second headquarters. And you can easily imagine why Amazon would want multiple bidders competing for them because in the United States, we allow um, communities to bid against each other for the favorable, favorable subsidies that we give to corporations to locate their stadiums or their plants um, within, our, within our area, which is problematic to begin with. But within that structure, when Amazon decided to search for a new location, um, it welcomed lots and lots and lots of municipalities and states to bid, and over 200 did. And each of those states spent millions of dollars hiring consultants to develop the proposal, asking their communities to sacrifice in order to lure Amazon to their community. In the end, the two that initially um, landed um, the, sp the split of, uh, of the second headquarters, and one of them eventually disappeared as part of a longer story, but the two locations, the New York area and the Washington DC area, were obvious choices to be on the short list from the beginning. And we can easily imagine why Amazon would want a third, fourth, and fifth bidder. After all, those other bidders might surprise them with the opportunities that they were able to put in front of Amazon. But I wanna suggest that when, by Amazon getting over 200 bids, they were wasting the resources of a couple hundred communities who were spending an enormous amount of taxpayer dollars when they had approximately zero chance to ever land the contract. And when companies extract waste from communities that taxpayers are paying for, that's taking away from schools and hospitals, that has to be viewed as a value destruction move. So I think we wanna think more about how to reduce our waste. Um, there's an organization 
um, that's part of the effective altruism community called 80,000 Hours, a terrific organization that helps younger people think through how they can pick a career that's going to allow the individual to create the most value over the 80,000 hours that's an estimate of how many hours they're going to work over their lifetime. Um, I think that the work of 80,000 hours is terrific, um, but I also think that there's lots of people who are um, older than that, um, than, than, the, than the core audience of 80,000 hours, and there's lots of people who are already engaged in their career, unlikely to shift. But we make lots of decisions about how to use our time, and we could do that in ways that would create more value. Um, I'm struck by um, an anecdote which will turn into a book by um, Linda Babcock at Carnegie Mellon and her colleagues, um, where um, Linda, um, as a uh, very well-known professor, uh, um, very committed Carnegie Mellon University citizen, good person, um, noticed that because she was good at getting things done, um, a visible academic, she was asked to do an unlimited number of things at Carnegie Mellon to serve on lots of committees. And one interesting observation by Linda and her colleagues is that um, it often feels like the right answer is to say yes when someone asks you to provide service. But the fact is you can't say yes to everything. And when you say yes to one activity, you're going to force out some other activity because the number of hours in the day is limited. And Linda and her colleagues created a club that's turning into a book um, called the Just Say No Group. And the idea is that it may be useful in many contexts to say no, not to be selfish, but because you can use your time more productively to create value for the world. So I want, you, I want to encourage all of us to be thinking about how, how to create value, but to not just use money and decisions as the resource we have, have but we also have time as a resource and we want to use it um, more effectively. And on the philanthropy front, um, there's a world um, well represented at Harvard and, and universities across the world called effective altruism. And the basic notion of effective altruism is that people should donate money to create as much value as you can, okay? Um, effective, altruis, effective altruists want us to donate more. They want to create the most value in the world. That means spending money efficiently and effectively. It means treating the interests of all equally. So the pain and suffering of some people is not more important than the pain and suffering of others. So we shouldn't discriminate against specific groups. And we should do our best to measure and assess what will create the most quality adjusted life years, qualities. So this is the kind of term that you see in the effective altruism movement. And the basic idea is that we could think about how to be more effective with our philanthropy. Now, the effective altruism movement tends to lean to three domains. One, send your money to the very poorest people in the world. And that often means emerging countries rather than domestically in the United States or other developed economies. It means reducing the suffering of animals on factory farms where the amount of aggregate suffering is shockingly high. And yet most of us who love animals, that certainly includes me, have a propensity to donate to dogs and cats. And if you, for some of you have been to my home and you know I love my dog Becca, but that doesn't change the fact that if we really wanna do the most good we can and reduce suffering of animals, factory farmed animals are a more important topic. And finally, future generations. We are discounting the lives of future individuals when we uh, sort of um, spend more money, raise less taxes and increase the debt, okay? Or when we destroy the environment and create climate change. So those are the three targets, but there's many of you 
who are committed to local suffering. And I'm not going to convince you otherwise based on the short pitch for the effective altruism movement. And I would argue we can still figure out how we want to be more effective and how we go about spending um, our very limited research dollars. So with that, I want to highlight that the, what the book is about is um, moving toward your maximal sustainable goodness. Now, many of you have seen the term maximal, maximal sustainable yield, um, which is a common term in the environmental world. And when I was describing this book in draft stage to a philosopher at the University of Vermont who was visiting the Sanford Center at Harvard, a guy named Mark Boldovson, um, he basically said, I think you're talking about encouraging people to reach their maximal sustainable goodness. So I'm not, at, I'm not encouraging people to reach an unobtainable goal like rationality or the extreme version of utilitarianism. But I am suggesting that the values of utilitarianism provide an effective North Star and we can move in that direction to maximize how much goodness we can sustain in our lifetime. So we could, there's some things that we can obviously do. We can donate more. We can deliberate more so that we make wiser decisions. We can aim to do as much good as we can. And in some, we can try to be better even if we can't be perfect. And with that, I'm gonna quit talking and I'm gonna wait for Todd to tell me what's on the minds of the rest, the rest of the folks who are on the call. Thank you, Max. Uh, at this point, everybody would applaud. Thank you. And, Thank you all. Yes. <laughs> um, so I want to encourage audience members to send in questions uh, and I will go through them and ask them of Max. Um, give me one second. Okay, so Max, this is, this is something um, that Jose Ariano asks. Um, can you tell, can you explain more the, why we should resist our intuition? Uh, and, and I think this is where we would, we would put a flag in your intonation changing when you started talking about blank. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so, so I think we should, it's not that we should avoid our intuition in the aggregate. I tried to argue that we all are going to make hundreds of decisions today and it doesn't need full deliberation. So um, I knew I was talking at 12 and I was on another Zoom till about 11.35 and I thought I might get hungry before this uh, talk was over. So I headed to the, um, to the refrigerator and grabbed some lettuce and some tofu croutons and some sunflower seeds, poured some olive oil on it. Um, and I had a salad very quickly. And, um, and I did that without doing any cost benefit analysis. I didn't even um, open up the freezer to see what the options were of what I could microwave. So I would say I broadly use my intuition to create lunch and I don't feel too bad about it, okay? The, the, the issue there is there's lots of small decisions that we make where the cost of deliberation is too high, so we don't want to deliberate, we want to go with our intuition. And again, I, I mentioned if your kitchen's on fire, you want to put it out quickly rather than analyze it in excruciating detail. But in contexts that are important, okay, um, where you have the time to deliberate and the choice is your intuition or your analysis, we have ample evidence that deliberation leads to high quality decisions across so many different domains. So simply the quality of decisions goes up with deliberation. Um, that's a, sort of an empirical result. Um, and there's nothing in Gladwell's book that would convince me otherwise. Um, what we also know is that we can induce deliberation. So I gave two examples um, of how to induce deliberation. If you encourage people to compare options two or more at a time, 
they deliberate more. It turns out that when we compare options, we, we engage our cognition. When we look at one option, we also, we often let our, our, emo, our emotion run, run wild. Veil of ignorance is also meant to be an induction aimed at increasing our cognitive deliberative processes. And in the moral domain, what we know is that people create more value and that they discriminate less um, um, when they're making a comparative decision rather than a separate decision. So all the evidence that we have suggests that we make wiser and more ethical decisions when we deliberate more. So that's my caution on intuition. I'm not, in, I don't mean to insult anybody's um, intuition. I'm just arguing that the empirical evidence is that the deliberation from that same person on average is both better and more moral. Great, thank you. There, there are a few questions about, uh, about what, what does it mean? What does goodness mean? And how do we decide whether we are moving to the Northeast? Yeah, uh, terrific question. So thank you. And, um, and I'm not being very original here. Um, I'm, I'm sort of um, channeling um, Bentham, Mill, Singer, Green to answer your question. Um, goodness, the definition of goodness that I'm going to create, uh, that I'm going to use, first of all, create more value. If you want to know what create more value means, it means to create more pleasure and reduce suffering. And in terms of a lot of the work, certainly in the philanthropy world, um, we, we can have such, we can have a dramatic larger impact if we focus on reducing suffering than we can in, uh, in terms of increasing pleasure. So um, what we want to do is we want to reduce suffering as much as we possibly can with the limited resource of our time um, and our financial resources. So um, what is it, how, how would I operationalize that? Well, the effect of altruists look for very complex metrics, but it provides a nice goal, uh, a goal state. Um, and I mentioned quality adjusted life years. Now, if I compare that to individual decision making, we say we use the term rationality. And we could say, what does that mean? Well, it means maximizing whatever you're trying to maximize in life. And all I'm trying to do is saying goodness is maximizing the value for all sentient beings in the world rather than just for yourself. Um, so I'm giving you a sort of a, a sort of a criteria that I would argue is roughly as objective as rationality. It's just much harder, obviously, to measure um, preferences and utility across 7 billion people and hundreds of billions of um, other animals. I accept that that's a hard calculation. Uh, um, but, but, but it, of course it's a hard calculation, but so is what's rational in so many contexts. And, and I'm arguing even if we can't get the measurement right, if we're headed in that direction, we're more, more likely to be moving in the right direction. And many, many separate comparisons. In fact, we can analyze the effectiveness of different outcomes in terms of the lives saved um, or the life years saved and um, do an okay job of being more effective than we currently are. Sorry to interrupt you, Todd. No, no problem. That's, that's, thank you for that. Um, okay, so there are a few questions also about how, how do we, how does better not perfect, how could it inform our current social justice situation? How can we use this to make people more aware of their privilege and act accordingly to support uh, Black Lives Matter and other disadvantaged groups? Uh, uh, absolutely. So that should be on the turf. Um, and I think it is. So utilitarians have long been at the forefront of being in, uh, in pursuing the idea of equality of interest for all. And obviously, we haven't done that for such a long period of time. Um, and you end up with interesting dilemmas um, as a result in terms of how to move forward. So I'll give you one example from the COVID story that I suggest that I highlighted earlier. So the utilitarian argument is to save the most quality adjusted life years possible. That's why 
Um, I like the idea of giving the ventilator to the 25 year old over the 65 year old, even though I happen to be 65. Okay. Um, now, what happens in a world where certain groups, for example, people of color, have health conditions that result from not giving them adequate access to health care for decades. And now all of a sudden, because of pre-existing conditions, they're not the best bet for who should get the ventilator. Now we could have a significant problem here, and I'm very sympathetic to the notion that um, people of color could be discriminated against by a very simple calculus. And that has to do with the fact that we've gotten it wrong for so long. But notice moving forward when we move to vaccines. Vaccines are going to show up and roughly 6.5 billion of the 7 billion of us are going to want one pretty quickly. Okay. Um, obviously there are vaccine denial people, which I, I, I don't understand all too well, but most of us want, are going to want that vaccine. Who should get it? Okay. And now all of a sudden, notice that people who have pre-existing conditions, people who are older, um, certainly healthcare workers, um, should move to the front of the line rather than the back of the line. So utilitarianism helps, but we, need, we do need to think about how different groups could be in a disadvantageous position because of the, uh, of the immoral decisions we've made for so long because we privilege the interests of some people over the interests of others. Thank you. Um, there, there are also a, a, a bunch of questions about how do we think about this from, so this, this framework of better, not perfect at the individual level versus at the collective level. And so it could be from a political advocacy perspective, hmm. uh, but also from a rolling up personal interest, not necessarily being the same thing as collective interest. Absolutely. Um, so, um, so I describe the effect of altruism community as focusing um, on, on three domains. And I won't repeat them because I, I covered them earlier in the talk. Um, I, I could imagine the question, um, how does giving money to one of those three domains compare with spending money to make sure that Joe Biden wins the presidency? And now we got now we have a really hard problem because I think that electing Joe Biden president of the United States is one of the most important moral and um, sort of um, uh, sort of um, logically important decisions for, that the United States is going has ever faced or will ever face. So um, ending the, the Trump value destruction um, is so critically important. So the question is, will your donation matter? Now, there's a very small probability that your extra $250 is gonna make a difference. On the other hand, the magnitude of the benefit that's created is so huge that political advocacy can very well fall in the realm of the most effective use of your time and your resources possible. So, um, Political adv advocacy is particularly important and just, just so salient under the current environment that we're in. How about this? How about uh, the second half where it is the, the personal interest? If we're all maximizing personal interest, does it not necessarily maximize collective interest? So, for example, um, one, we might think that our, that with lower taxes, we can reallocate the money where we think it would have the most effect versus the higher taxes yeah. would allow for some collective allocation. Yeah, so I don't think that there's much evidence that our personal allocation would be more effective. Um, but but it, it sounds like um, um, that argument is returning to sort of Milton Friedman of the six from the 1960s or even the 1970 New York Times piece that was recently re-reviewed in the uh, in the New York Times. Um, I forget the author of the of the contemporary piece, but but Friedman basically argued that um, that the that the objective of a comp uh, of uh, the objectives of the manager 
of a corporation should be a maximize shareholder profit. And, and, and with that argument, he even confused many people to believe that that was a legal responsibility, which never happened to be the case. Um, and, um, and sort of extreme free marketeers believe in some magic of the power of markets that that will somehow aggregate into the wisest decision possible um, with very, very little evidence that that's likely to be true. Um, and if we take the sort of extreme version of Friedman in terms of thinking about the manager of the corporation and apply it to the individuals, um, I see no compelling argument to imagine that pure self-interest is going to aggregate into something that's better for all. The simplest arithmetic is that, um, that if I give an extra thousand dollars away to a very effective charity, the benefit to the recipients of that charity are going to gain more value than the cost to me as a Harvard Business School professor. And in doing so, um, I will sacrifice a little, but other people will gain a lot and there would be more value in the world. Um, even better, so I don't have to sacrifice, if I can make decisions to allocate my charitable dollars or my time to more effective organizations, then more value ends up being created. I think it's useful to think about this, so many ways in which we're not on the Pareto efficient frontier, that we donate to ineffective organizations. We give our time where it's not creating the most power, where we are involved in encouraging waste in ways that are, are harmful. We could eliminate so many of these inefficiencies, make the world a better place, be happier about who we are, um, and we don't end up with this conflict between self and others in such a concrete form. Thank you. The, um, so now how, how does, how would pursuing this path uh, change our interest in doing better? Uh, right, so, so by advocating the letting loose of the standard of perfection, uh, yeah. we may take baby steps and is it, is, how do you think that would change? It, does this become a self-fulfilling virtuous cycle? Yeah, so, um, so I'll, I'll tell you um, two stories um, to answer this question. Um, these are two stories that are in the early part of the book. Um, uh, so I became a vegetarian in 1993 and, um, and I was giving a talk that fall to an, to an, at an environmental conference. And um, I mentioned I was a vegetarian and um, somebody in the audience um, started his question by saying that he was a vegetarian too, but he ate fish. And I made the completely stupid comment of saying that would make you a fishitarian. Now I knew the word pescatarian, I was trying to be funny, um, but more importantly, my colleague, Doug Medin, a world-class cognitive psychologist and nice guy came up to me afterwards and said, Max, that was really stupid to call, to insult the guy. If he wants the term vegetarian while eating fish, you should let him have it. If you try to take it away from him, he's more likely to eat red meat than to stop his fish eating. And I think Doug was exactly right. For whatever reason, I was trying to encourage this person in a moment of stupidity to a level of what I perceived to be goodness that wasn't viable. 25 years later, when I was uh, um, speaking at a conference on effective altruism um, at MIT, the speaker before me was a guy named Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute that basically highlighted trying to convert people to vegetarian or veganism um, is a shockingly unsuccessful enterprise. And he laid out a, a movement to harness the energy and money of investors, of founders, and of food eaters to create more new foods that were based on plant-based products that people would simply want to eat um, rather than um, preaching to them. So 
Friedrich, I, I was identifying a path to be better because the path to what a vegan would view as perfectionism wasn't particularly obtainable. And I think that the utilitarianism is often viewed as being too demanding. It's just no matter what you do, it's not good enough. And my reaction is having impossible goals is just not very motivating for most of us humans. And far better is to say, maybe you want to audit your life, which I think I try to do on a pretty regular basis, and not have the notion, how do I get to perfectionism? But how can I be a bit better this year? And I'm pretty sure that if I can be a bit, bit better this year, next year I'll probably want to be a bit better as well. So if we can put ourselves on a path toward constant improvement, I think that that's much more effective than identifying what does goodness look like and trying to convert other people to that particular level. Um, so my book really tries to be less preachy and just saying, you, you, to begin with, you're not going to buy the book if you don't want to be more ethical. And if you do want to be more ethical, I think that I can offer a pathway that you might find um, quite attractive. And I think those of us who are better this year than last year, we should take pride in that rather than um, beating ourselves over the head about the fact that we're not perfect. Um, I, I, you reached a crescendo on that. I feel like that's, that's where we should end, but I, but I have more questions and there are more questions here. I, you run the joint, it's your call on how we proceed. I, uh, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you one more chance at nailing, at nailing the landing in a couple minutes. That but that was a great answer. The um, so there are a bunch of questions about like how how do we have interventions to identify what is utilitarianism wise ma like maximal like as if there are as if the major barrier as if a major barrier is identifying what is uh, m what is utilitarian maximal. I mean your your framework of like making Pareto improvements doesn't require that kind of a difficult calculation. But what are, what are the, are, is that a major problem identifying what is the best? Um, yeah, so, and what, so, what so, are the barriers to knowing what's best? Yeah, so I, th so, um, I think that some of these are tough choices, others are easy. So um, on the donation side, um, there are organizations. So givewell.org is a terrific resource for I, where they will spell out how they do their best to measure quality adjusted life years and how that leads to a set of concrete recommendations about the organizations that will create the most value for your charitable dollar. But there are other times where it's simply easier, but we just don't get around to doing it. So I've already given away my age. Um, so I wanna tell you about 15 years ago when I turned 50, and I thought for my fi for, for turning 50, I should get a birthday present for myself. And um, what, I, what I picked out for myself was that I quit four academic editorial boards. Now, for the non-academics out there, um, in academia, we do a lot of peer, re peer re review. Um, and, um, and if you sit on the editorial board of a journal, you review even more papers. And so for my 50th birthday part, for, for 50th birthday present, I did an audit of my life and I tried to figure out what things do I do in life that I don't really enjoy and I don't want to do as much of. And an easy answer along with grading, attending faculty meetings was reviewing papers for journals. So I don't, don't want to, if I wouldn't want to read the paper, if I wasn't reviewing it, then I don't want to be reading it to review it. Now, reviewing papers provide service. But by age 50, I had already reviewed an awful lot of papers. And there's a lot of 25 to 35 year old doctoral students and assistant professors who I honestly believe with their higher motivation could do a better job of re reviewing the paper. So if I can get that work off of my desk and onto their desk, 
and not use the time I freed up to simply party um, or to make money, but in fact, turn that to other ways in which I could create value in the world. That's a really good trade-off. Now, we could ask lots of measurement questions, okay? Um, and, and I will admit that all, the, all those are quite useful, but I think that the notion of doing the qualitative assessment of is there something better is often something that we can do in a fairly easy way. So I'll simply ask the person asking the question or, or all the people still listening, um, are there things that you do that you don't like where the value you're, you're creating is remarkably small? And if there is, do you have to be doing those things or can someone else do that so that you can reallocate your time in a more productive fashion? And I'm confident that most of us are gonna come up with pretty good examples of what we could do. Thank you, Max. Uh, with that, we are, we are at the end of our one hour. Uh, and uh, for the attendees, thank you for coming. Go buy Better Not Perfect. It's, it's out. It's also a great audio book. Uh, and Max, thank you for sharing your wisdom in the book and over the course of the last hour with us. Todd, Maya, thank you for all you do in creating this, this um, community. And thank you for allowing me to share my uh, new book with your audience. Thank you. Okay, Maya, I think that it passes to you. Or I will. Uh... So with that, Max, I think I'm. I, we exit and, and okay. we say Thank bye you. to the 80 people still on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Max, as I think I'm going to try and be the last person on. Okay. So are you? Yeah, I'll stick you, around. You can. Okay, you can stick around or, or hop oh, off. You, you tell me. I, I'm licensing you to hop off if you would. Okay. If you would like to get hop off, or you can stick around with me. We um. There are twenty some people still on. Thank you for your final minutes, whoever's sticking around. Um, Max, do you uh. Who, who is your like ideal audience for the book? Like who, who this feel, this audience feels different than the other books that you've written. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the audience is obviously less businessy. So uh, a lot of my books um, sort of when I write about decision-making or negotiation, um, I think that the ideas are relevant to everybody, but they certainly have a more businessy feel. This book doesn't necessarily have a businessy feel, although there are certainly some examples that fit that. The, 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 they come from the business world. So the answer is anybody who wants to lead a better life, anybody who's um, frustrated and confused about how to go about um, optimally um, giving away their their, their um, philanthropic dollars, people who are, who don't know how to manage your time more effectively. Although I think all those pieces fit in. You could also imagine even, even the effective altruism world. I know that you're, I mean, cause, cause people who, like you're saying, can't live up to it. I, I bet that they have a bunch of people who, for whom yeah. they are deterred because it is an unattainable goal. Absolutely. So, and, and, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, so I think that there are some messages um, to people who might be more extremely utilitarian in terms of sort of highlighting that, that the world of behavioral science gives us insight of pushing for the impossible is probably not a good idea. Yeah. I also, I, we, whoever's still, <laughs> still I, it, it, it felt like a tour of your last several decades of work because like this is the, the it's the it's been the implicit frame for so many rounds of the work whether it's the audit work or you know or the the blind spots or uh or the negotiation value creation it was just it was it, it seemed like it was a it 
it makes it seem like it's a linear sensible I hope so. Yeah. With more, with, with, again, broadening the audience of who gets the value. And I think that that's, that's what ethics is about. So I, I've, I've never liked notions of ethics is don't lie, uh, don't cheat, et cetera, et cetera. It, one, people kind of know those messages. Two, we can find examples of hi in history where um, we don't sort of, we don't agree. So John F. Kennedy um, lying about the nature of the agreement with the Soviet Union um, about Turkey missiles um, may have been absolutely critical to saving the world. So, you know, uh, sort of universals like don't lie, just don't provide much um, use 